In the earlier days of Final Fantasy VII's development, the narrative was in a constant state of flux. Various drafts had been pulled together by senior figures within the company, and it was unclear what the story's central theme would be and what genre they were going for. While Yoshinori Kataze worked on figuring that out, designers like Tetsuya Nomura latched onto various ideas. For example, it had been decided that unlike Final Fantasy VI, where Kataze felt any of up to 10 characters could have been considered the story's protagonist, Final Fantasy VII would be more cut down and more traditional. This saw Cloud Strife designed as the first character, the hero, and Aerith Gainsborough designed as the second character, the heroine. As the narrative built out, these two characters remained, but there were discussions as to how death could be used to reflect one of their core narrative ideals relating to life. After much discussion, it was decided that one of the main characters should be sacrificed in order to give depth and weight to that theme. Having become frustrated with the perennial cliché where the protagonist loves someone very much and so has to sacrifice themselves to express that love, the team decided to challenge the so-called Hollywood ideals. Instead, they would create a situation where the death was unexpected and players would be left thinking, if I had known this was coming, I would have done things differently. Thanks to this decision, Aerith has become one of the most famous video game characters of all time, transcending the franchise and entering into pop culture. But there's so much more to her character than just this one scene, and that's why we're excited to run through her origins and wider story with you in this video. Before we do though, just a quick reminder to let us know in the comments who you'd like us to see cover in a future Origins video. Alright, so let's get started with Aerith's origins. Aerith was born in the small town of Icicle Inn on the 7th of February 1985 during the Mew era. Her parents were Gast Faramis, a former Shimmer scientist, and Ephalna, the last remaining pure blood Cetra. On the surface, Aerith's birth seemed as normal as any other. There were no issues with her health, and her parents loved each other very much. But deep down, almost everything relating to her birth was complicated by her bloodline, for there were those who wanted to use Aerith for their own personal gain. By their very nature, Shinra's scientists were always desperate to learn more about the world they inhabited, and in their insatiable search for knowledge, there were often no limits as to how far they would go or how low they would stoop. When they discovered an ancient extraterrestrial organism named Genova, this fueled their thirst as they believed such a discovery could see their company transcend to the next level. Desperate to learn more, Shinra dedicated vast resources to what became known as the Genova Project. It would see Professor Gast, an eccentric but kind-hearted academic, installed as the project lead and he would be assisted by Professor Hojo and Lucrezia Crescent. Their goal was to try and revive the Cetra, an ancient race who they believed could guide them to the promised land. Gast, despite being the project lead, often steered clear of the inhumane experimentation and atrocious acts that were committed in pursuit of this goal. Unlike his contemporaries, he had no interest in the acquisition and consolidation of power, so instead preferred to take a softer approach. It meant that while Hojo attempted to learn fast by taking greater and greater scientific risks with no thought of morality, Gast spent much of his time speaking with Afana, as he viewed her as a much more valuable source of information. It was during these conversations that Gast learnt Shinra had wrongly concluded that Genova was of Cetra origin, and that as a consequence of this incorrect assessment, they had been conducting experiments that would have dire consequences. Such was the revelatory scale of what he had learnt, Gast decided he did not want to share this knowledge with his fellow scientists, and so, upon learning the truth, Gast helped Ifana escape her cage before then himself absconding from both the Genova project and Shinra. Together, the pair retreated to a remote laboratory in Icicle Inn, and it was here that Gast hoped to continue his research undisturbed. During this time, Gast became more and more fascinated by everything Afalna knew about the history of the planet, but his fascination developed beyond just her historical knowledge. Likewise, Afalna was more than happy to indulge Gast's curiosities as she enjoyed his company. Over time, their feelings developed to the extent they decided to have a child together, and when she was born, they named her Aerith. This event was life-changing for Gast, and it led to a lot of self-reflection. Up until that point, science had always been his number one priority, but now he had a family, and he swore to protect them, no matter the cost. Gast would have surely hoped that situation would never occur, 
but just a few weeks after Aerith's birth, his resolve was put to the test as Hojo raided his secret facility. Knowing what fate would befall his family, Garst made a desperate attempt to help them escape, but his efforts were futile and on that day Aerith lost her father. As Garst fell to the floor, Aerith was abducted alongside her mother by armed guards and taken to a Shinra research facility to live out her days as one of Hojo's lab rats. Keen to unlock more secrets about the ancients, Hojo made sure they were held captive at the Shinra headquarters, and over the next seven years he continued to prod and probe, no doubt giving little concern for their health or well-being, outside of needing to keep them both alive for continued experimentation. Despite the hardships, Ifalna tried her best to teach Aerith about her heritage and the unique relationship they have with the planet. Given their environment, this proved to be difficult. They needed to be free. So when the opportunity presented itself, Ifalna mounted a daring escape so that her daughter could at least experience a sense of freedom, even if she knew it may not last. Through sheer grit and determination, the pair managed to make their way to Sector 7, but it was here that their journey together ended. During the escape, Ifalna had received a mortal wound, but as she lay dying on the steps of the Sector 7 train station, fortune shined upon her. Around the same time, a woman named Elmira Gainsborough had been visiting the train station on a regular basis. Her husband had been sent to fight in the Wutai War, but after receiving a letter, she believed he was coming home. Yet, he never did. Day after day, she visited the station, only to be disappointed each and every time. But one day, Elmira happened upon Ifalna and Aerith. Realising her time was short, Ifalna bestowed the fabled white material on her daughter that had been passed down through generations, and with her dying breath she begged Elmira to keep her daughter safe, something that she agreed to do. After accepting that her husband was not coming back, Elmira decided the best way to keep Aerith safe was to take her in and raise her as the daughter she never had. This was difficult at first, as Elmira had no appreciation for Aerith's bloodline or what she had been through, but she knew there was something different about her and remained calm and patient. With the passing of her mother, both of Aerith's parents had given their lives to try and keep her safe from the clutches of Shimra's science department, but even though Afana had been more successful in her attempt, it was still for nothing, as Shimra continued to monitor the situation from afar, just as they had done when Afana escaped with Gast many years before. As a consequence, not too long after Elmira had taken Aerith in, she was contacted by Sung of the Turks. He had been tasked with reclaiming Aerith on behalf of Shinra, but this time their approach was different. Unlike other members of Shinra, the Turks believed that Aerith could be convinced to participate in their research of her own accord, and they were willing to play the long game, something that was aided by President Shinra's focus being drawn away from their plans for Neo Midgar due to the Wutai War. Sung was able to convince Almira of their more noble intentions, and she agreed to cooperate with their plan as long as they kept their distance. To aid with this, Almira and Aerith were relocated to the Sector 5 slums, and from there, Sung continued to watch Aerith and try to assuage her of Shinra's plans. Even though it wasn't ideal, it was a fortuitous move for Aerith, for deep within that sector, there was a special area of land within a church that was unaffected by the destructive leaching of the macro reactors. It was here that Aerith, even though she didn't know at the time, could commune with the planet. She was also able to grow flowers, a remarkable feat, and sift through the noise of the planet to hear her mother's voice. During this time, Aerith visited the church on a regular basis. Sung also became quite close to the family and began to see Aerith as more than just her mission. But despite his best efforts, he was unable to make much progress in bringing her in. This dynamic showed no sign of changing until Zack Fair fell from the skies and landed on Aerith's flower patch inside the Sector 5 church. After Zack came to, Aerith was initially unamused by his confident advances, but she did indulge due to her kind-hearted nature. And as the day progressed, and she saw how Zack interacted with the common folk, Aerith began to wonder if there was something special about this guy behind that obvious bravado. After Zack bought her a pink hair ribbon, Aerith decided to put something to the test and brought up the elephant in the room, Soldier. Due to what had happened in the past, Aerith, despite her general positive and loving outlook on life, had a deep-rooted loathing of Shinra. She tolerated Sung, but his actions and general demeanour had done little to convince her that there was anything genuine relating to his interest in her. Zack, though, was different. And when she discussed her concerns about Soldier, Zack's reaction showed Aerith that not everyone in Shinra was a bad person, and that maybe she had been wrong to judge the company as a whole based on the actions of the few. 
Over the next few years, Zack and Aerith became quite close. When they were together, they would let their guard down and just be themselves, and it was nice. But Aerith wanted more. Even though they had been seeing each other for some time, Zack was often called away for work, and Aerith wouldn't see him for long periods. It meant the time they did have together was all the more important, especially as Zack was becoming less consistent with his availability and his focus. To try and keep him rooted, and to try and maximise the time they had together, Aerith went back to one of the first things Zack had said to her, selling flowers. Things didn't go as Zack had hoped, but for Aerith, everything was perfect. She cared little about how much money she could make or how many flowers she could sell. For her, it was just about spending time with Zack and sharing something together, and in that regard, the plan had worked perfectly. But it turned out to be bittersweet, as this experience would be the last they would share together. Zack went on a mission, and despite his assurances, never returned. Aerith was used to having a pseudo-long-distance relationship, but when the communication with Zack stopped, it was difficult to accept. Sung, her only other contact within Shinra, no doubt assured Aerith that Zack was fine, and as Zack could no longer be reached by phone, he suggested she write letters that could be passed on. Zack's absence, combined with a wider yearning to escape Midgar and speak to the planet outside of the church, led Aerith to explore, but her naivety caused an uncomfortable situation when Avalanche learned of her location. They knew of Shinra's plans to try and harness the power found within the fabled Promised Land, and hoped that by working with Aerith they could locate it and then protect it. Much as Shinra had done in the past, they were forceful with their approach, but when they realised Aerith knew nothing, Avalanche abandoned her plans and left her alone. It was an eye-opening experience, and it made Aerith realise that running away would not solve her problems. She was better off staying where she was for now, tending to those who needed care, like her flowers. And this made her think of Zack. In many ways their relationship was quite superficial, but they were both young and impressionable, and even though Aerith had never been able to cement her relationship with Zack, she had still developed deep feelings, and she longed to see him again. The flowers helped her to reminisce, and they led to her revisiting the notion of selling them, this time by herself. Aerith wanted to believe that Zack would one day return, but having heard nothing for years, she had all but lost hope of ever seeing Zack again. She decided that her 89th letter would be the last, but shortly after sending it, Aerith felt what she had always hoped she would never feel. On that day, Aerith knew that Zack had died. Due to her bloodline, Aerith had always had a connection with the planet. She could hear voices and could sense death when it affected people close to her. When she felt this about Zack, it affected her in a significant way, but she continued to be kind to people and selling flowers as it reminded her of better times and the kindness that he showed. Two months later, this decision would lead to an odd encounter. Having grown in confidence, Aerith had started to sell her flowers above the plate, but after the Sector 1 reactor exploded, there was chaos on the streets. It was during this panic that Aerith met a young mercenary called Cloud Strife. She thought nothing of the encounter at first, but when Cloud fell through the roof of the Sector 5 church not too long after, Aerith's curiosity was piqued. As she had done when Zack fell through the roof, Aerith tried to be warm and friendly, but this soldier was different. Cloud looked very similar, but despite attempting to be confident and sure of himself, it wasn't convincing. He was also wielding the Buster Sword, a weapon with deep significance to Zack, and it led to Aerith wanting to learn more, but she needed an excuse to spend time with Cloud outside of just making small talk. When Reno crashed the party, looking to kidnap Aerith as Shimmer's priorities had changed back to working on Neo Midgar, that excuse materialised. Aerith asked Cloud to be her bodyguard, and learning from her first encounter with Zack, offered to go on a date as payment. As they lost their pursuers, it became even more clear to Aerith that something wasn't right with Cloud. The way he interacted wasn't natural, and people who should know him didn't. Based on this, Aerith chose to be closed off in subsequent conversations, often baiting Cloud to see how he would react, and being dismissive or deceptive whenever he had questions in response. These interactions continued to play on Aerith's mind, so when Cloud voiced his intent to leave and head for Sector 7, she made sure he did not do so without her. It gave them a chance to talk more, and this time Aerith chose to be a bit more vulnerable as she alluded to knowing someone in Soldier, but refused to disclose who or the truth behind their relationship. Before she could delve deeper, Tifa was seen heading to Wall Market. Aerith knew that Cloud would want to try and investigate, and to make sure he couldn't ditch her, she led the way. It saw Aerith become wrapped up in a much wider plot, 
and as a consequence, she lost her freedom. Having been patient all these years, Song used Marlene as leverage to take Aerith back to the Shinra headquarters of her own accord, all so that she could be used once again as part of Hojo's scientific research. Due to Aerith now being the only remaining Cetra, Hojo came up with a devilish plan to mate her with an unnamed species that had an extraordinary lifespan. This would give them a concrete backup plan should anything nefarious befall Aerith and would give him valuable insights relating to interspecies breeding. Just as Hojo was attempting to realise this plan, Aerith was freed from her cage by Cloud, Tifa and Barrett, but her freedom was again short-lived as the Turks imprisoned the group. During this time, Aerith confessed to herself and everyone else that she knew little about her heritage, and that what she did know was just theory. It's why when the group escaped from the oppressive clutches of Midgar, Aerith's mind wandered away from finding the truth about Zack and why Cloud was eerily similar. For the first time, Aerith was able to taste true freedom. She would have the opportunity to explore her heritage and learn more about her role in life. The only challenge was that she didn't quite know how. Aerith chose to stay with Cloud as he explored the world, hoping to stumble upon something that could help her unlock the truth. But even though her goal had now changed, when they ventured to Gongaga, Aerith was forced to remember the uncomfortable situation relating to Zack and Cloud. After speaking with Zack's parents, Aerith revealed to Cloud that not only was Zack her first love, but that he was also a soldier first class. When Cloud showed no recollection of such a person, Aerith chose to downplay the significance and played along perhaps realising at this point it was better to protect Cloud. He clearly believed what he was saying to be the truth, and with Aerith now able to commune with the planet more openly, she must have sensed something in Cloud, much as she had sensed something in Elfe many years before. Soon after, Aerith spoke with the elders in Cosmo Canyon. They enlightened her about the Cetra, the Promised Land, her powers and her responsibilities. But now, having been exposed to the knowledge she had craved for many years, Aerith felt nothing but loneliness and isolation, for she knew the task of saving the planet would fall to her, and nobody else. Armed with this knowledge, Aerith chose to stay with the group as they continued on with their quest, for even though she had learnt much from the Elders, there was still much she didn't know, and as they ventured on, Aerith hoped to try and shift the balance in their favour. With Cloud, she continued to be patient, not overreacting to any obvious signs of struggle, even when they resulted in significant physical outbursts, and she did this because deep down she knew that the real Cloud, the one who wanted to protect those he loved, was still there. As Cloud handed over the Black Materia, and having learned to Sephiroth's wider plan, Aerith knew that the time was right for her to act. For many years, she had been unclear why her mother had given her the White Materia, as she had no clue how to use it, but after being given a mission by her ancestors, everything was now clear. Aerith left the party and made for the Forgotten City, and it was here that she used her powers to pray and summon Holy. Desperate to stop Aerith, Sephiroth attempted to use Genova to thwart her attempts, but even though Genova was able to kill Aerith in the physical sense, she had been successful with her prayers, and the last remaining survivor of the Cetra had completed her mission. The death of Aerith had a significant impact on the rest of the party, and once Cloud's mind had been restored thanks to help from Tifa and Aerith, the group vowed to stop Sephiroth, through sheer grit and determination, they accomplished this objective. Sephiroth was slain in the physical and spiritual sense, and with the resistance gone, Aerith was able to use her influence to try and save the planet, but her actions had consequences. Sephiroth had been defeated too late, and Holy was failing. The only option was to use the life stream to aid Holy, but having avoided dissolution, Sephiroth used this situation to his advantage to spread due stigma as the life stream fell back to the planet with the objective of one day being resurrected by his remnants. Aerith, aware of this plan, considered also creating remnants to combat this threat, but decided against such a course of action as it would sully her friend's memory of her. Instead, she chose to fight this new threat indirectly, appearing in visions, controlling the environment, and providing cryptic messages. This, combined with the efforts of Cloud, Tifa, and the rest of the group, allowed them to defeat Sephiroth, his remnants, and cure the citizens of their geostigma. And with that final act, that concludes the story of Aerith Gainsborough, one of the deuteragonists of Final Fantasy VII and the wider compilation. Within the annals of history, Aerith will always be remembered for her surprising death sequence much more than the value her character added to the wider narrative. And that's a real shame, because Aerith is a character rich with backstory and plenty of growth. 
Having grown up in a physical and metaphorical cage, Aerith grew to appreciate the value of freedom. It led to her often forsaking her own so that others would know its joys, and in the wider sense, this served as an example of the ideals Aerith had been raised with. Despite the whimsical, carefree exterior, Aerith had a lot of inner strength. Her first instinct was always to help, no matter the consequence, and once her mind was made up about something, there was often no dissuading her. She believed in the inherent good in people, and was always willing to give them a chance, even if others wouldn't. And that's why her relationship with Cloud, while unconventional, is so fascinating. Despite all the warning signs, Aerith chose, over time, to accept Cloud for who he was, often forgiving him for any indiscretions, and it was through her assistance that Cloud was able to find himself and become the man everyone needed him to be. It means that while Aerith may not have had as much screen time as many of the other characters, her contribution was significant, and it will always be remembered. But with that small analysis out of the way, that marks the end of this Final Fantasy VII Origins video. Thank you all so much for watching. We very much hope this video did justice to Aerith's character, as well as the intricate web that is the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. It's going to be very interesting to see how this is expanded upon within the remake, especially the scene where Cloud wakes up within the church. If you enjoyed the video, then please do hit that like button, share this video around to all the people you know who love Final Fantasy VII and are excited for the remake, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel. Also, be sure to let us know what Aerith means to you as a character in the comments, and let us know who you'd like us to cover next. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. A big thank you to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thanks to all of you for joining me on this deep dive into the lore of Final Fantasy VII. I hope to see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.